morning god bless you welcome to another sunday morning training session i was going to say wednesday but another morning training session it is already april uh, april the 10th time's going by real fast this month right april the 10th and uh my name is pastor curtis and we are here in uh, zurich switzerland um in in uh, resurrection life church and so we do welcome you you can go to our YouTube channels. We have uh, over 250 videos. You can watch the YouTube, our YouTube channel. Amen. And all the things that we're doing here. And we just welcome you. And we believe that God is going to speak to you this Easter week. Because we're going to have on Friday is Good Friday. On Sunday will be Easter. So we're gearing this whole week up towards that resurrection time. Amen. But before there was resurrection, there was a Good Friday for us but a bad Friday for Jesus. But Jesus turned his bad Friday into a good Friday for us. Amen. So we're going to, now listen, I have a, quite a bit of scriptures because I want to reaffirm the plan of God. Now, people want, some people will ask, why did God create man and create woman? Only one reason, he wanted a family. He wanted a family. Amen. Hallelujah. So God, I mean, uh, some of you have children. Why did you create your child? Because you wanted a family. Where did you get that from? God. Amen. So uh, it's, it's actually not normal not to have children. Okay. It's more normal, much more normal to have a child than not have a child. Okay. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it can be a personal choice. But 99% of the time, uh, God said, multiply, have kids, uh, be a blessing. Amen. And so that's what God's plan was. And it came from heaven. I want a family. So he created a man. He created a woman. And we're going to start with Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14. And it says this, first slide. The Lord God said to the serpent, remember he had man and he had, the uh, Adam had his wife, and then here comes the enemy. As soon as God made a family, here comes the enemy immediately. I mean, I mean, the family, we don't know how long that Adam was with, with Eve before the enemy came. I believe it was immediately. He came immediately. Why? To break up this family, to cause this family to be divided or divorced from God. And cause it to be separated from God and separated from the plan of God. Amen. And it happened just like the devil wanted. Amen. The 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 woman um, um, uh, ate the fruit, gave it to the husband, and then they both became guilty. Amen. So it says this uh, in verse fourteen. And, and and remember this: this was all plans. God knew from the foundation of creation, the foundation of the world, that. Adam and Eve would fall, would make a mistake. But he already had a backup plan. Thank God. Amen. He wasn't scrambling in heaven and say, oh, what do we do now? What do we do now? No, he knew. He knew. He knew what was going to happen before it happened. Hallelujah. The Lord God said to the serpent, to the what? To the serpent. That's the devil. Okay. Because you have done this, you caused, you, the, you literally, you, you broke up my family. You broke up my family. That's what God says. Because you broke up my family, and that's why 
husband and wife, if you have a family, don't you let nothing break up your family. Nothing. Oh, so quiet today. Listen, audience out there in TV land, here in my church, it's so quiet, you could hear a mouse right now. Don't let anything, I said don't let anything break up your family. There it goes, a little bit. Just one amen is okay. Don't let anything break up your family. You have to fight for your family because the enemy, like he did Adam and Eve, he'll come to divide and he'll come to separate and he'll come to destroy it. Amen? And if you're not aware of that, this is what, this is, what is happening, okay? All over the world, the devil is trying to confuse families, put families against one another, put kids against the children and children against the parents and, and all kinds of things. But you've got to be aware of, of what is happening. Amen? And then the, uh, it says, because you have done this thing, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And so what's that mean, eat dust? Well, he called him a serpent, right? He's a serpent. And the, one of the lowest animals in the world who is always on the ground, on the dust, Living on the dust is a serpent. Amen. He's always, I mean, in, in the, um, it, some, some historians say that before Adam and Eve fell, that snakes had legs and arms. They actually could walk upright. They found a fossil in Israel of a snake that had legs that could walk upright. But here, when God pronounced, because you did this, now, why would you say, why would you say, um, on your belly you shall go. Evidently, he was not on the belly. The snake were not on the belly in the beginning. Part of the curse is that now you will be on your belly. Amen. And, and it says, um, uh, thus, shall eat, thus shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. The, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so we see that God had literally a plan of victory in the middle of defeat. God knew, he knew that the man would fall, but he already had a remedy for it. Amen? And sometimes I believe we forget it. I mean, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Easter, but we sometimes we forget about what Jesus did. And one of the greatest ways... To, um, to, to revisit what Jesus did for you is to watch the Passion of Christ. Because when you watch that with no words and you see the beating the, the, uh, of an innocent man, of a man who willingly, like a lamb going to the slaughter, he what? Open not his mouth. He had every right to open his mouth and say, I am innocent. I have no sin. I have the blood of God in me. I have no sin. I don't have the nature of Adam. I have, I have the nature of God the Father in me. Therefore, the, 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 the Romans and the, the high priests, the Jewish uh, religious leaders, they have no right to condemn me. They have no right to put me to death because I'm innocent. I, I have never sinned. Never. Yet, the Bible says, he opened not his mouth. And because he opened not his mouth, he's just as, as well saying, I am guilty. Not opening up your mouth meant I'm guilty. I take the guilt of the world on my shoulders. I become guilty. So what? So what? So what? So why? So you can become what? Free. Not guilty. Not guilty. You are not guilty. You are free. Amen? Slide two says this. Genesis 3 and 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So we see that um, um, Adam, because before, remember, they were born into the world, actually born. Adam was the only guy in the world born at the age of 30. I mean, he was 30 years old, when, around 30, when he was created. Amen? So he, wasn't, he never had... Adam never had a belly button like you have. Never had a belly button. None. Didn't have one. You look at his stomach and say, what, what, you look funny? He said, yeah, 
I was born 30. <laughs> I don't know about you. So uh, he never had a belly button. He never had, uh, they never experienced the things that the, the, the uh, advanced uh, creation experienced. Amen. Can you imagine living in those days and there's no doctors and there's no nurses and there's no dentists. There's no, there's no, there's no, no, there's nothing. Everything is by trial and error. You're just trying to make this thing work. And, and um, that was 7,000 years ago. And some, uh, you know, I, 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 to me, it's amazing. You still go to some countries and it seems like they are still living almost in the days of Adam and Eve. The conditions they live, the poverty, the poorness, the, the, the attitude. It's not, it's, it's, it's not so much advanced as we would think it is. Amen. Hallelujah. There are some countries that are advanced, but most of the world is living on a dollar a day. And imagine from the day that God created us 7,000 years ago to right now, and still more than half the world is living on $1 per day. That's not right. There's something wrong with that. Amen. And when God put all these resources on the earth for his who? Family. Amen. Hallelujah. And I, I see all of these, um, these um, rich, 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 ultra rich people who, I mean, they just take care of their family. They do everything for their family. Education, cars, three cars, a helicopter, airplane, fire jets, all of these things for the family. Well, you think though they are better than God? No. When God made a family, he put all the resources there could be on this earth for his family. Amen. And it's the devil keeping God's people poor. It's the devil keeping God's people uh, with, uh, with debt out of this world. It's the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, so here's Adam and Eve born. They, they had no clothes because the Bible says they were naked and they didn't know it. They had no sense of shame, no sense of nakedness. They, it was normal. Everybody, everybody was naked. There was only two people. Everybody was naked. It was a big deal. You know, so they had no sense that they were ashamed. Amen. But when, when they sinned, all of a sudden with this sin came sin consciousness. They have a consciousness that, wait a minute, because who, what did God tell Adam and Eve? Who told you you were naked? Who told you that you did something wrong? Because what's Adam's hiding now? God came down every day in the cold of the day to talk to them, to fellowship with them. And now God's come down the, on, on this particular day and he can't find Adam because he's hiding. So he says, uh, Adam, Adam, where are you, my son? I mean, we always meet at this time. We always have good fellowship, and he can't find it because why? He's hiding, and he's hiding because he realized now that sin made me naked. Sin made me made me realize I was naked. Sin made me realize, and that's what the devil he wants you to always realize that you are unworthy, that that you are going down, that you don't deserve blessings, that you don't deserve promotion, that you don't deserve a husband. You don't deserve children. You don't deserve a good job. You don't deserve that apartment. That's all he could accuse you. He's always telling you what you don't deserve. And God is always telling you what Jesus paid for caused you to deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. We sing a song. Amen. You deserve it. Yes. You may have made a mistake. You may have sinned. You may have, but I'll tell you what, the blood, when you ask God to forgive you, that blood still speaks. That blood is still powerful. That blood still works. Amen. When you come to him. So, and it says the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothe them. And people will say, what, did God kill a, a, a sheep or cow or goat? What did, do, what did God do? How did he get the skins? What did he do? Well, uh, there's all kind of uh, hypothesis. One of the things is, is that we all, everybody in the whole world believes that uh, Adam ate and, and Eve ate an apple. Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say they ate an apple. It does not even mention the fruit that they ate. But we do know this. They're not supposed to eat from the fig tree. So if they're not supposed to eat from the fig tree, then maybe the fruit was a fig. It makes more sense. Maybe the, 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 what God used to cover them was, was fig leaves. Because they ate the fruit and there's the leaves. And fig leaves are pretty, are pretty big. 
Amen? So uh, we don't have all of the, 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 the history, but that seems more reasonable. So when God covered them, that temporary cover was so that they could have, they could be, have, have a restored consciousness and restored fellowship with God. Not like it was, but at least they're not condemned forever for, to hell. Amen? Slide 3, we're looking at it. It says this, Exodus 12, 20, uh, 46. It shall be eaten in one house. This is God telling them, telling the, the Jews or Israelites how you're going to um, um, uh, how you're going to um, celebrate the Passover. It says this: It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh. Talking about the lamb, right? Uh, in, any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Amen. And we see that Jesus was what. The Lamb of God, and they were on that that night, that Friday night when Jesus was crucified, and the storm came and the earthquake came, and Jesus wasn't quite dead. They were about to break his bones. Why did they break bones? Because when they break your the legs, your bones, on your on the cross, all of a sudden you have nothing to support your breathing, your lungs, everything. You're going to be die, you're going to die more instantly. They were about to break, but the prophecy says. Not one of his bones were broken, so instead of breaking his legs, they pierced his sides. Just like the Bible said, just like prophecy said. Amen. And, and, and if you want to know, that's uh, Russian scriptures, okay? If you want to know what scriptures are those, those are, that's not tongues. That's, that's Russian, so you know. It says this, Psalms, one, uh, Psalms 16, verse 8 through 10. I have set the Lord before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to where? What's another, another word for sure? Hell. So this is more or less Jesus speaking. You will not leave my soul in hell. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, or let your Holy One see corruption. And these are all uh, uh, scriptures before the death of Jesus. These are all prophesied before the death of Jesus. So that when we get when when Jesus died and then the the, re, the the birth of the church, we would have all of these scriptures to say God told us, God told us, God told us, God showed us, God showed us, God showed us. Amen. Hallelujah. So God had a plan. Everybody say God had a plan. God had a plan. God had a plan. God had a plan. Amen. He's never, he, he wasn't surprised. He's not shocked. Oh, my God, God up in heaven. Oh, my God, inflation is 17%. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? No, he's not shocked. He knows everything. Amen. Amen. And faith can move every mountain in your life. Any difficulty, any impossibility, anything. When somebody, and you know, if you, when you, if you want to make me mad, Tell me that it can't be done. That's what makes me mad. You know, I had a, a, a preacher friend, and um, he came to work for me for about eight months here. He's from America. And uh, so he went to, he was build, I told him to build something, a project, and he was, had to go to the lumber store to buy this and buy that and buy this. He says, Pastor, when I went to that lumber store, they told me what I couldn't do. You can't use this for that. You can't buy this for that. He said, yes, I can. In America, you can buy what you want to and do with it what you want. But the Swiss here are telling you, that's not used for that. That's not used for that. We don't want limits. If I want to put a, 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 a Swiss chocolate bar in the freezer, it's not a sin. <laughs> you may think, what? You put that, that candy bar in the freezer? I do it all the time. Am I evil because I put chocolate in the freezer? You understand? So my, my thing is this. Let people live their lives. You just take your eyes off of them, and you make your life better. You do what you can to make your life better, and quit pointing fingers at somebody because they're not like you. Amen? It just so happens that there are over 200 nationalities in the world. 
So everybody's not like anybody. Amen? Yeah. We have to learn to live with one another because in heaven, there's no Swiss corner, Italian corner, USA corner, oh. Ukrainian corner, Russian corner. No, we're all one big happy. Oh, can, uh, wait, wait, wait. Can we actually say that? One big happy family? family? Is that the only time that could happen is in heaven? Because as long as you're down here with flesh, with the devil, you will never have one big happy family. Amen. There's always one child in the family. Why did they call one child the black sheep? It's not because he's black. It's because he's different than everybody else. Uh, he's different than all of us. My, my spiritual father, Kenneth Hagin, he would always say, he says, the nut never fall, falls far from the tree. The nut never falls far. What's that mean? Well, when, you look at, when I look at a, 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 a father and then I see his son, I say, that nut never fell far from that tree. Because the way, uh, uh, here's, what, here's what Brother Hagen says, Kenneth Hagen, he says, one of the hardest things in the world for parents to do is discipline their children. And then he said this, and the reason is because they see so much of themselves in the child. I mean, it's some, sometimes it's almost scary. And some parents say to, about their children, I don't know where they got that from. And we know for a fact where we're looking at you and we know they got it from you. Okay? Because a nut doesn't fall, fall, doesn't fall far from a tree. It's that close. Amen? And that's why we're supposed to be supposed to be working on our image to be more and more like our father. The Bible even says in Ephesians, it says, uh, uh, children, imitate your father. Imitate your father. We're supposed to copy God. We're supposed to be like God. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. We, we know if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Amen? It's a challenge to be like, uh, to be like God the Father. But we can be more and more and more as we read his word. It's like a mirror and we can see more and more of the reflection of Jesus in our life as we walk with him. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's Jesus. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus knew the plan. He, you know, he even even Jesus knew by reading verses, reading scripture, because we know when he was 12 years old, he was lost. He was he was with these rabbis. He's learning about the Bible, learning about uh, the, his call. He was learning about God. He wasn't just out there playing like a normal 12-year-old boy would, would be. He says to his parents, <clears throat> Mom, don't you know that I have to be about my father's business? I got to know. I, I got to know who the father is. I got to know about him. I got to learn. I only had 33 years in this world, so I didn't learn about the father. And he would learn about his father. And he learned about his father. And then he learned so much. God didn't have to say this, but he said it. He said on the Mount of Transfiguration, he says, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. Obey him. This is my beloved son. I love my son. And you follow him. Because what he says is all true. Amen. So it says this uh, in our, our next slide. It says this in Isaiah 25. We're looking at scriptures that port, uh, portray or, or prophesy Jesus Christ paying the price for our sin, becoming a sacrifice for us, amen, so that we would not have to be condemned. I think in, on the, if I'm not mistaken, you have a, a picture of a, a, a box, right? A gift box, right? Well, the greatest gift ever given to man was Jesus. Hallelujah. There is no, great, no greater gift, no, no greater gift than to give Jesus Christ to humanity, to mankind. That's why I chose that box. Jesus is, 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 is what a gift, what a gift, what a gift, what a gift. Amen. It's a great box. Amen. Yes. Isaiah 25, it says this, he will swallow up death forever. Oh, hallelujah. 
This is talking about spiritual death. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away. Do, uh, did you forget about this verse? He will wipe away tears. Did you forget about this verse? He will wipe away tears from what? All faces. And the reproach of his people, he will take away from what? All the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might, what? Save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We have waited. Father, we've waited for you. We've waited. We've waited for Jesus. We've waited for Jesus. And here it is. This is the day. And the Bible says, Today is the day of your salvation. The day you said yes to Jesus was the day that you opened that box. And that gift became personal. It became your gift. Jesus is your gift. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. Amen. You don't have to share him. He belongs to each and every one of us. He's big enough that it's called, he can be your own personal Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says this. I gave my back to those who strike. What? I gave my back. The, the, we know in the Gospels it says Jesus laid down his life. He laid, they, they didn't take his life. They thought they were taking his life. He says, if God never gave you that power, you wouldn't have no power to take my life. I lay it down. I lay it down. He says, don't you know I can call legions of angels and they'll come right now because I'm innocent. I don't have no sin in me. I have a right to call angels and, and the angels will come. But I open my, not my mouth. I'll just let it happen because I know this is the plan of God. And this is who our Savior is. This is who Jesus is. So he gave his back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace. and I hid not. In other words, when somebody's spitting on you, what do you do? Natural reflexes to, is to move. You move your face. He said, I didn't move. When they beat me, they say, they pulled hairs out of my beard. I just said, go ahead and do it. Right. Okay. I pulled, I pulled out the beard, hair out from my beard. I pulled it out. And we don't understand the pain that would be. We don't, we don't understand the pain that there is. Amen. Let's go to the next one. Uh, oh, yes, okay. Go to the next one. It says, uh, number, set, uh, number eight says this. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. I mean, so many people rejected him. So many Jews rejected even today. Many Jews reject Jesus. The majority of the Jews still reject Jesus. They think a Savior is coming sometimes. But this wasn't the Jesus they were looking for. They rejected him. The religious leaders rejected him. Some of his own family rejected him. Some of his brothers rejected him. They said, no. We, who are you? Who do you think you are? We reject you. We reject that. And then, as you see in the in, when, in, when the birth of the church, you see some of the brothers of Jesus eventually coming around to realize this was the Savior of the world. My brother, my brother was the Savior of the world. My brother, imagine saying this, my brother was God. My brother was God. Imagine that. Amen? Amen? 
So, so even his own family rejected him. Even remember, you remember the story where he was in the in the synagogue and and um, and all his family came to get him out, take him out. And he says, "Hey, your mother and family are here." He says, "My mother and father are only those who do the will of God. You tell them I am doing the will of God, and to leave me alone." Amen. So he was rejected by his family. He was rejected by religious leaders. He was rejected by the government. He was rejected. Rejected by the devil. Rejected, rejected, rejected. And only at that time a handful received him. He even had disciples in John 6. In John 6 it talks about he was preaching his message and he did his miracles. And then he started preaching about unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh. You have no part with me. And, they, and people start saying, what? He's talking about cannibalism? And the Bible says many people left him and he called them his disciples. So it was, he did, Jesus did not just have 12 disciples. He had 12 disciples who were close to him, but he had thousands of other disciples. And many of those disciples in John 6 left him. And then Jesus looks over to his 12 disciples and says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter said this, where will we go? You have the words of life. Where will we go? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to ask you a question today. If you didn't have Jesus, where would you go? Who would you go to? Some people say, I'll go to Buddha. I go to Gandhi, I go to Confucianism, I go to whatever false religion, I go there. Well, I, and you go to Isaiah, it says, God says, God says, there's no other God that I know of. That's what God says. I don't know any other God but me. So there is no other God. Man has tried his best. I remember Paul went to, to, uh, uh, to Greece, and when he goes to Athens, he sees all of these gods that they're serving and worshiping. And one of them had, was called the unknown to the unknown God. Well, they knew all these other gods, but God, our God, was called the unknown God. And that was the God that God says, let me tell you, uh, that Paul said, let me tell you about him. The unknown God. He's Lord. He's the Savior. He's the healer. He's the protector. You're worshiping gods made with stone in man's hands. But let me tell you about the unknown God. His name is Jesus. He's the Son of the living God. The living God. Hallelujah. That's who that's who the, the, the God that Paul served. That's the God that you serve. That's the God that I serve. And the devil wants the, the planet to serve all these other false gods. Gods that bring you no salvation. Gods that bring you no eternity. Amen. You see all of these people doing a, 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 a yoga meditation. And they're trying to reach this state of euphoria where I'm, I'm, I'm at one with the earth or I'm at one with this or one with the universe. I'm sorry, that's not God. You cannot worship that, that, those things. Amen? You might, what, one thing good about yoga, it makes you flexible, your body. That's about it. You're not getting no, no in, in, in enlightenment with that. Because your only enlightenment is Jesus Christ. Your only enlightenment is God the Father. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, in Him I live and move and have my being. In Him. It's not, not, not in anything else but in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and you, uh, um, uh, there's a book called, uh, a little book called In Him. And in that little book, there must be about 50 scriptures in the New Testament about we are in him, in him, in him, in him, in him, in him. In him. Amen. Amen. And they, when you do all these other things, they want you to go. They want you say they want you to go outside of him, outside of yourself. Go outside of yourself. Let your mind be neutral. N let me tell you a secret. Never let your mind be neutral. Never let your mind be empty. You know why? Because the devil will fill it up fast. You can be sure of this. Okay, he's looking for an empty mind, so he can fill it up with his stuff. So never, never, what you fill your mind with is the Word of God. Amen. So we're looking at this. See, he, Jesus, 
He did not hide. He took this pain. He took this punishment so that we could be born again so God's family can be reconciled. Hallelujah. Amen. Isaiah, next slide, number eight. Isaiah 53, 5, 6. All of these are before Jesus died. All, all before, before. But he was pierced for... There you go. He was pierced for my transgression. He was crushed for my iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought me peace. With his wounds, I am healed. And me, like all the rest of the sheep, have gone astray. I have turned, even me, to my own ways, and the Lord has laid on him. All the things I did wrong, all the, my selfishness, all, of my, all, all that I did wrong, God laid it on him, and now I'm free, free, free. And that's why the Bible says, Whom the Son has set free and free indeed. But the devil is always trying to put, load you down with your past. You did this. You did that. You said this. You said that. You spent this. You spent that. You dreamed this. You dreamed that. Oh, yeah, and he wants to weigh you down, weigh you down, so that you can't believe you can fly. I believe I can fly. The devil says, no, 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 no. That's just a fly. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. And the Holy Spirit says, yes, just come on up this way. And the devil says, no, 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 no. I'll have a say. I'm telling you, you can fly in Christ like the eagle. That's right, like the eagle. Soar like the eagle, but the devil wants to chain you down. You see all of these strong, strong, strong animals. I saw, I was watching a, a movie called Bonanza. It's a Western from way back then. I love Bonanza. And, and you see, the, they ride up there with these horses that weigh 200 pounds, and, and, they, and, and they're riding, riding. These horses can, can kill a man easy. And when they get off the horse, they take that little rope, and they don't even tie it around the bar. They just wrap it once around the bar, and somehow that horse do doesn't know that he can rip that whole tree out of the ground, but he just stays there. An elephant is the same way. The elephant is so big, one of the biggest animals in the whole world, that animal can knock, can knock over a truck and car and an airplane. He can pull all kinds of things, yet you put one little chain on him and he doesn't move. And this is what the devil wants to do to God's people, to chain them. But I tell you what, your chains are broke today in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Hallelujah. Break, break, break every chain. Yes, please. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Break every chain. Because it's time for the church to rise. Yes. It's time for the church to fly. Yes. It's time for the church to be light on its feet. Yes. Not bogged down by all the mistakes and sins and all the things that hold you back. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. God wants you free. Yes. God wants you free. Yes. And you know what? Even though you don't know it, you want you free. You know you do. You're not free when you don't have peace. You're not free when you not, don't have joy. You're not free when you don't have the things in your life that you know God and Jesus paid for. You're not free. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 All we like sheep have gone astray. Jesus. We have turned. Everyone. Everyone. You see that? Everyone. Everyone, everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him. 
Oh, Jesus, thank you so much that you took those. Oh, man, if you didn't take those, they would be still on me. If you didn't took, take those, I had no right to pray for healing. If you didn't take those, I have no right to have peace. If you didn't take those, I have no right to, have mer to receive mercy, to receive forgiveness. If you didn't take those, Jesus, you took them from me. You pay the price. I saw in a post on Facebook, it mentioned all of the things. It said un, uh, unforgiveness, uh, um, uh, this much it costs, and um, um, mercy, this much, and all. And it mentioned uh, 10 things, and it mentioned the price, and the price was for this receipt, your life. And right at the bottom of it, it says paid in full. Somebody paid for all your mistakes, all your sin, all your bad decisions, paid in full. You are free. I said you are free. Free, free, free. You are free. Hallelujah. I got a few more verses. Um, um, in in uh, Luke 23, 34, it says this. Jesus said, Father... Forgive them. That's enough. That is enough for you to go to heaven. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his clothes. Jesus says that to, to when you ask him to forgive you, he says, Father, they asked me to forgive him. I do. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them. And God always says, yes. Because no matter how many times your child makes a mistake, your child, your son, your daughter, it doesn't matter how old they are, no matter how many times they make a mistake, if they ask you to forgive them, you never say that was the last straw. You never say that. You may say that for a second or two because you're so mad. But you can always come back around to who you know. That's your flesh and blood. And you're going to say you're forgiven. Yes. And if you do, you're no greater than God. He's going to forgive you also. Amen? Amen. He's going to forgive you. You have a clean slate. The next one, Luke 23 to 43, he said to him, Luke 23, 43, he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be in paradise. And we know this, this was one of the, the robbers who was crucified with Jesus on his side, on the right side, Right? And when he said, uh, Jesus, what? Remember me. Remember me. In other words, I believe in you. I saw the earthquake. I saw the day turn into night. I saw that you should be dead now. I saw them ready to break your bones. I saw Jesus. Remember me. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, I mean, you can be for a fact, today you will be with me in paradise because you believed in me. Because you believed in me. Amen? Next verse says this, John 19. I know I have a lot of verses today, but I want to reaffirm what Jesus did for us. When Jesus saw his mother and disciples whom he loved, Standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. From that hour, the disciple, that disciple took her to his own house. I want to look at something here. Here we go.
Hallelujah. So he gave he gave away his mother. My mother is no longer my mother, John. She's your mother. And then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that, from that hour, that disciple took his own, took, took her to his own house, her own home. So Jesus gave up all. I mean, there's there's in, in my mind, and probably most of the world's mind, is the greatest thing in somebody's life is a mother. More than a father is a mother. A mother's mean everything. Mothers are everything. Yes, we we have all kind of conflicts and families, misunderstandings, uh, cultural divides, all the things that causes families to fight their, their fight each other. This this internal fighting. There's all these things that cause us to fight and it's not easy for a mother to be quiet. It's surely not easy for young children to be quiet or kids. Because kids, when they hit a certain age, they think they know more than you. And that's a fact. It's not until they hit the age of about 30 when they realize that mommy was really right. But it takes them all those other years to figure out by getting hit, hitting every, their head on everything hard to realize Mommy was right. You know what? I really had a smart mom. Your, your mom never changed. She was a smart when she told you when you were 12 what to do or what not to do. And so a mother's job, oh, man, it's, it's so, so, so difficult. I mean, you look at Jesus when he was on the cross, and you see his mother from the distance looking at her son. And the only thing that, would, that caused her to probably not want to commit suicide or kill herself was that she had a supernatural visitation from an angel when she was 12 years old. She knew this angel said that this boy is going to be the savior of the world. He's going to save mankind. And all the other experiences that she had uh, with, with uh, her son, Jesus, from when he, when he miss, was missing for three days, when he turned water into wine, when he healed blind man, when he stopped at a, a funeral, when he did all those things, his mom was right there in the background. She knew all these miracles that took place. She knew it. She was in the upper room when, when, when uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out. She spoke in tongues. She knew all these things. All these things. And Jesus said, and you, you, you just have to, you have to go inside her mind to understand when he was crucified on that Friday night. And he's dead. He's gone. There's no life in that body. They're taking that body down. They're taking the body down. It's dead. Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. The front newspapers, of all the newspapers there, says Jesus is dead. And under the, the, the scripture, it says Jesus is dead. All of the Sadducees and Pharisees and the Romans were saying, yeah, we knew it. Yeah, he did all these miracles. That Those miracles are from the devil. We're glad he's gone. And they're writing an editorial about how glad they are that Jesus is dead. Then they go down to hell and everybody's reading the editorial. Jesus is dead. Yes, yes, Jesus is dead. But Ephesians says that Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost goes down into hell. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, the glory of God, raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit goes down into hell, and he begins to clean out house, clean house. And there's a rumbling in hell. Jesus said, thou, thou wilt not allow my soul to be in hell. Shell or hell. You will not leave my soul there. You will cause me to rise up again. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you, Father. You will not leave my soul in hell. I trust you. 
I give it all away. I turn up my face to those who spit on me. I don't turn my chin to who, those who pour up my beard. Go ahead. I trust you that you will not leave my soul in hell. And on that third day, Jesus, oh, he's down there waiting. He has never in his entire existence been, been uh, separated from the Father. And he's down there thinking, oh my goodness, what are you looking at? Demons are everywhere. Evil spirits, hell, the smell of sulfur, hot down there. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost creeps down through hell. He goes down in there, and he, call, he begins to clean house, and Jesus' chains are broken, and Jesus goes where the enemy is, and he takes the keys of hell and hell, and he says, It is finished! I said it is finished! All the sins of mankind are forgiven. The family is restored to God. Yes. Hallelujah. That's what he said. It's restored. Father is done. It's restored. And then the father says, well, then there's no need for you to be down there no more. Come on up. Come on up. And Jesus, God was so good, he gave Jesus 40 extra days on the earth after the resurrection. After the resurrection, Jesus had 40 days. He was on earth and he appeared to people. And he appeared to this one. And he appeared to that one. And he appeared to this one. The, the, the two on the road to Emmaus. And he began to tell them about the whole plan of salvation. This is not just Jesus. This is your Jesus. Hallelujah. This is your Savior. This is your life giver. This is your healer, your deliverer. This is your helper. This is your first love. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. So you're free. Why are you walking around here in chains? The chains have been broken. You're free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Free people walking around like an elephant with chains on. All this power. All this anointing. All this glory, all in us, and we're walking around like an elephant with chains. Let the chains be broken. Yes. Let the freedom come. Let your life begin to rise up and begin to fly. Ooh. Fly, fly like an eagle. Like an eagle. Up above your problems, above the situation, above the circumstance, above poverty, above, 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 above. Where you're seated at the right hand of God. Yes. A place of authority. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I got one more slide and I'm done. I can't believe I'm so long today, but Luke 23, 46, last slide, the last slide. Jesus calling out with a loud voice, so I have a right to call out also today in a loud voice. Father! Into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus is dead. When you, when you breathe your last, in case you didn't know, you're dead. <laughs> when you breathe your last, you're dead. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama tsabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God answered from heaven, saying, I forsook you, son, so I won't have to forsake them. 
I forsook you so I don't have to forsake them. And we know the story. After those 40 days, and if you don't know the, the, the history, but Jesus, 40 days, after he was resurrected, he walked on the earth. You know, he cooked fish for the disciples. You know the story? The men on the road to Emmaus, doubting Thomas, he appeared. So many instances in the Bible where Jesus appeared after the resurrection. Why? Just to prove to them that everything I told you for these three and a half years all come to pass. It's true. Everything's true. And not only this, but there is someone who's going to be greater than me. And, and, and you can see the disciples say, somebody greater than you? There's nobody greater. He said, nope, nope. There's somebody who can do what I couldn't do. Who is that? He said, the Holy Spirit. See, I can only go with you here or there, and I go there, but if the Holy Spirit's with you, he can be in each and every one of you and go wherever you go, each and every one of you. He can be everywhere where you go. And he'll always lead you to me. And he'll always remind you what I said. He's greater right now on the earth. Not in the heaven, but he's greater on the earth. And this is, and he says, I need you to get him, receive him. Go to the place of the upper room. And they go up there, 500 people. And somehow the 300 and so for, uh, you know, the pastor's preaching too long or nothing's happening. So it was the window down to 120. And those 120 was in this room. And they said I was in that room. I, I went to Israel and they said this is a room, but you never know. And they up there, and man, imagine this as I close, how hot it was, how dirty, how misty, how in those days, oh man, they had candlelights. And they're all waiting. I can imagine why the other 300 left because it's like, come on, man. He's, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Why are we here? What, what, what are we waiting for? And some begin to rumble. Hey, let's get out of here, man. There's nothing happening. There's nothing happening. But those 120 who stayed, I said who stayed, who suffered in the flesh, who didn't let their flesh get in, in, in them and decide to leave, they stayed and they experienced the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in their life. And even M Mary, the mother of Jesus, was up there. And it transformed their lives. And the, the next thing you know, and as I stop, I have to stop now. The next thing you know, when you look at the, the 12 disciples, all of a sudden, such a boldness came. Because when Jesus was dead for those three days, three nights, and, and a few, uh, and, and before he appeared to the disciples, they all went back fishing. They, took, they went back to their old job. And then Jesus said, here I am. And then when Jesus ascended to heaven, one thing you can see that all those disciples had that came on them was a boldness. I said a boldness. And that's what the church lacks today is the boldness in Christ. You, when you know who you are in Christ, when you know what Jesus did, we need to be bold. And the Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion. Wow. That's right, as a lion. And we're getting this today. I did not, I didn't have no intention at all to make you feel condemned. No intention at all to make you feel bad. None, none, none. But this is to enlighten you and encourage you and inspire you to rise up and break those chains off of you. Amen. You got everything you need to break the chains off. You got everything you need, but you have to break them off because it's time to fly. Amen. God bless you. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I pray for the audience out there and those who in here. I pray, Father God, that you just use these words that you have given me, Father, and you use these words to inspire your family, to encourage your family, to uplift us, to 
to put in us a drive, a desire, a hunger to push forward, to go in, to go more in, in you, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your plan, the book written for us, that we will fulfill it, Father. And we thank you that we'll stand up in these last days and be used by you as part of the end-time army of God, and that nothing can stop us in the name of Jesus. If you have chains of any sort, any kind in your life, I break those chains in the name of Jesus. I command those chains to fall off of you. I command that call of God to rise up within you. I call, command that book that was written about you. I command you get on the page and be in the timing of what God has for you today in the name of Jesus. I mind every assignment the enemy has put against you. Every word spoken against you, I curse in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I command you to walk in your freedom, walk in your light, walk in your heaviness. That, that, that heaviness, we command it to stop right now. Right now. Right now. No more heaviness. But we exchange that burden, that lightness of Jesus. That, and, and he takes our heaviness. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, I thank you that we are free and the chains are broken. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you on the next broadcast.